Community Voices, Comedy Edition. Hello, today I'm a lumberjack, and this is our Surrealist Comedic Writing Workshop Day. I'm going to let you decide if those two things are related. If this is your first time tuning in, I'm not always a lumberjack, but I am always the host of this workshop, the Community Voices Comedic Writing Workshop, right here on the Old Globe YouTube page. Each week, I'm bringing participants a different style of comedic script writing to consider. We share lots of examples of this writing style. We discuss it a little bit. We hear it in action with a performance presentation. And then I invite anyone in the whole wide world of the internet, including you, to send me their own scenes inspired by a different prompt each week. The end goal of this workshop is to share all of that funny writing that has come from it in a really exciting, splashy, digital performance presentation at the end of April. I wanna take a moment to thank everyone that has already shared their writing thus far. It has been a super duper treat reading your original funny scripts. You're all really funny as heck. And if you're at home thinking, hey, I wanna write something I'm funny as heck, then I'm here to tell you, please do. There's still time to participate, lots of time. And you can go back and check out any of the past workshops we've hosted and catch up all on the YouTubes. This workshop is intended to stretch those writing chops through the use of short accessible writing prompts. There's something for everyone here. But today is about surrealism and I'm a lumberjack. So what the heck is this genre all about? Well, surrealism writing was inspired by an entire movement of the same name, surrealism. Though it is utilized a lot less in the modern age, it was once originated in Paris in the 1920s, and it includes any kind of media that uses shocking, irrational, or absurd imagery, or Freudian dream symbolism to, chant, to challenge the traditional function of art to represent reality. This includes the principles, ideals, or practice of producing fantastic or incongruous imagery or effects in art, literature, film, or theater by means of unnatural or irrational juxtapositions and combinations. In comedic writing, surrealism plays with absurdity, elements outside of the norm, heightened emotion, cartoonish type choices, and expanding on a theme or emotion rather than focusing on linear story. And once again, emerging its characters in a dreamlike environment where reality seems altered. The dreamlike landscape style can lend itself to a lot of dramatic works. And more and more and more surrealism dramas that push outside the norm can be found in your local art house cinemas near you and get nominated for all of the Golden Globes that they can handle. But there are certainly examples of comedic surrealism too. Uh, you, can, you can check out a lot of titles of comedic surrealism. Pieces like Monty Python, Twin Peaks, which is a combo dark comedy, very dark, dark, dark comedy and surrealism. In fact, most things David Lynch are dark comedy and surrealism. There's the fun Groundhog's Day genre with a day repeating itself over and over again. Any of those time repeating films that have come out are surrealism. Russian Doll, Palm Springs, that teeny bopper one that just came out on Netflix, all of them. Just, they're just fabulous examples of comedic surrealism. So let's go ahead and jump into sharing another piece so that you can hear surrealism slash absurdism. A lot, these, these two genres play off each other a lot in action uh, with a reading from three wonderful actors. We're going to share the first scene of Wanda's visit, not to be confused with WandaVision, two very different pieces. This is Wanda's visit from Christopher Durang. Christopher Durang is a wonderful, comedic, surrealist playwright that loves to push into the world of absurd humor. Let's dive in. All right, hello. Let's say hello to our three featured actors for today. Hello, Chris. Hello, Liesl. Hello, Rianne. Thank you for joining us. 
So I, before we jump into our reading, I wanted to ask the three of you if you had any absurd um, film, television, or theater that you personally enjoy. And let's start with Liesl. Liesl, do you have any references you like? Uh, I would say Amy Sedaris is the one to go to, and I would definitely suggest looking for Strangers with Candy, which is one of my favorite uh, influences in this genre that also has Stephen Colbert in his early days. So many famous well. people were on Oh, yeah. Show. Oh, yeah. And yeah. At Home with, with Amy Sedaris is also yes. really, really, really great. It's like a fake home uh like a home ec show essentially <laughs> like how to be a hostess and it's all fake and it's amazing she also had a guest spot on um on unbreakable kimmy schmidt for, that was really hysterical she's just like a she's a hilarious comedian and i recommend her so and her whole life is outside the box yeah i love her yes how about you rianne what's your oh my goodness ref? Brent's. I had I had to Google I had to Google a list okay. and the, the one I actually know a lot more than I thought I did but one I saw right at the top of the list was one I just Swiss Army Man with Paul Dano and Daniel Radcliffe it's I don't. one of those movies don't give it away because like the whole premise is the movie but yes, yes. it is if you've seen it you know you know you know you know what did what do you enjoy, what did you enjoy about it? I I can't give it away. I can't give it away. I just I just really like how just uh literally just absurd it is. <laughs> they just really took it that far and further. <laughs> Absolutely. Great reference. Definitely check it out. And then Chris, what's your what's your favorite? I love Mr. John Waters movies, Hairspray, Crybaby, uh Pink Flamingos, Serial Mom. Just, These are all like rated X, so we can't really <laughs> guess that you watch them, especially with your kids. But you know, if you're having a late night and you want want to watch a, a NC-17 film and you want to laugh, I totally John Waters is great. <laughs> Those are great recommendations, you three. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna jump into our reading, and for this for a moment, I'm going to vanish, and so will Liesel, but she'll be right back, and I'm gonna go ahead and read the stage directions of this piece. You, you, you all ready? Indeed. All right, let's, let's do it. Wanda's Visit by Christopher Durang. Scene, a comfortable home in Connecticut. This is the home of Jim and Marsha. They enter and come speak to the audience. Our lives have been seemingly dull for a while. You know, nothing major, just sometimes being quiet at dinner. After 13 years, you run out of things to say, I guess. Or else it's a phase. I think it's a phase. Uh, me too. It'll pass. We've been married for 13 years. Our anniversary was in March. So in March, we went to dinner and tried to get drunk, but we just got sleepy. We didn't try to get drunk. I did. We had a very nice time, but the wine made us sleepy. We were in bed at night at 1030, asleep in bed. Well, we were tired. And then the next week, I got this letter from this old classmate of mine. Wanda. He never mentioned her. Well, she was just some girlfriend, you know, high school. Wanda. And Wanda wrote me saying she'd like to visit, and I asked Marsha if she'd mind. I have trouble saying no. Most women do, I think. It's not pleasing or something. Anyway, Jim got this letter. And Wanda said she was going to be in our neck of the woods. And I hate the phrase, neck of the woods. And I asked you if you'd mind, and you said it would be fine. Well, I have trouble saying no. You know that. You should have said, are you sure, or really, or something. Well, I didn't. I thought it would be fun, you know, to mull over the old high school days, the prom, the high school paper. I was editor. And really, what a ball for me. And Marcia didn't seem to mind. I mean, I can't be a mind reader. So I wrote Wanda back and told her we'd love to have her visit. I mean... Really, it might have been fun. In high school, Wanda had been quite a looker. And of course, what an enticement for me to meet an old high school fantasy. Lucky me. So we set a date, and Marsha cleaned the house and baked a chicken. Jim refuses to cook or clean. I mow the lawn, you make the chicken. We're old-fashioned, I guess. And so we waited for her visit. Lights change. 
sound of a car driving up, stopping and door slamming. Oh, I'll go, honey. It must be Wanda. Jim goes off to greet Wanda. Marcia straightens up things one last time. Offstage, we hear great whooping and enthusiastic cries. Jim! Jim! Marcia looks startled and curious. Wanda and Jim come into the room. Wanda is also in her late 30s, early 40s, but unlike Jim and Marcia, she's not in great shape. Her clothes are a little gaudy. Her hair is odd and messy, but she also looks kind of fun and colorful. Jim. Wanda throws her arms around Jim with great abandon and then holds his embrace as if her life depended on it. Marcia goes closer to them and waits patiently for the appropriate moment to be introduced. Jim. Jim, oh, Jim, Jim. Hello, I'm Marsha, Jim's wife. Wanda breaks from the embrace. Oh, hello, nice to see you. I was just so excited at seeing this guy. Hey, guy, hey, how you doing? I'm fine. Wanda? Are you expecting someone else? No, it's just... Well, didn't you used to be blonde? Yeah, and I didn't used to be fat either, although I'm not really fat. My woman's group doesn't let me say that. I just have a food problem and some of it shows. But really, I just lost 20 pounds. You should have seen me last month. You seem quite thin. Oh, you're sweet. I may look thin, but I'm really fat. Do you have anything I can eat? Well, no, no, I'm just kidding. It was a joke. Seemed like this was a setup, you know? I talk about my weight and then I say, can I have some food? But if you're hungry. I am not hungry. Say, Jim, I love your wife. She reminds me of my mother. <laughs> no, no, the positive side of my mother. Really, really, I like both of you. Thank you, I like both of you. What? I like you, and I like Jim. Better? You're married to Jim, you lucky dog, you. Oh, give me another hug, guy. Wanda gives Jim another bear hug. Uh, Why don't we go in the living room? Wanda careens into the living room area, looks around her, they follow. I love this room. It's so country. Did you do it, Marcia? Well, we bought the furniture. I never thought of it as doing it, actually. Oh, it's wonderful. And I should know because I have terrible taste. What? I mean, I can evaluate good taste in others because I have such bad taste in all my own choices. For instance, my house looks like the interior of a Baskin Robbins. Everything is plastic and there are all these bright yellows and dark chocolates. Really, the only thing worse than being married to me is to have me decorate your house. Well, I'm sure you underestimate yourself, Wanda. Isn't he a dreamboat? You're a dreamboat, dreamboat. Well, say thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything to eat? Pretzels or something? Well, dinner should be ready soon. Oh, Lord, I don't want dinner yet. Just some pretzels would be good. Something to munch on. Would you like some pate? Pate? Where'd you get her, honey? The back of New Yorker? Sure, honey. I can eat pate as long as you have crackers with it and maybe some pretzels. Fine. I'll be right back. Marcia exits to the kitchen area. Oh, Jimbo, she's a jewel. An absolute jewel. Wanda sits next to Jim. Thank you. We've been married 13 years. Oh, an unlucky number. But she's a jewel. I hope she's not hard like a jewel, just precious. Yes, she's very precious. Good. You know, I hate to say this, but I don't recognize your face, actually. That's very perceptive, Jim. I've had plastic surgery. But it wasn't the fancy schmancy kind to make your face look better. It was so they couldn't find me. Who couldn't find you? I don't want to talk about it. Not on the first night, at least. Now you've piqued my interest. Oh, you men are always so impatient. 
Wanda squeezes his knee. Marsha comes in with the pate and notices the knee squeezing. Marsha sits down with the pate. Wanda is seated between Jim and Marsha. Here is the pate. Thanks, honey. I'll just have the crackers. She munches enthusiastically mm. on a cracker. Stoned wheat thins. Mm. I love this. She's a jewel, Jim. I know. You're a jewel, Marsha. Thank you. Would you like a drink? Wanda pauses for a moment and then begins to sob very genuinely. <laughs> uh, don't feel you have to have a drink. Wanda, what's the matter? <laughs> I don't want to burden you or your wife. Uh, that, that's all right. I'm sure we'd love to be burdened. I mean, if it would help you. Yes, tell us what's the matter. I don't know where to begin. I'm just so unhappy. Gosh, Wanda, what is it? Well, it all started the summer after high school graduation. Jim and I had gone to the prom together, and though, of course, nothing had been said, everyone just kind of presumed he and I would get married. Really? Who presumed this? Well, everyone. My mother, my father, me, everyone. Gosh, I mean, I knew we dated. Dated? Jimbo, we were inseparable. From about February of senior year to June senior year, we spent every spare moment together. You gave me your class ring. Look, look, I have it right here. She looks through her purse. Oh, no, I can't find it. She keeps looking. Jim gave me the nicest engagement ring. Huh, uh huh. Now, where is it? Wanda dumps out the messy contents of her purse and looks through the mess. Oh, no, no, no. Here's the prescription second all. I always carry with me in case I feel suicidal. I don't think any of the pharmacies are open this late. Oh. Uh, forget about the ring, Wanda. Uh, tell us why you cried a few minutes ago. Isn't it obvious? Isn't what obvious? Seeing the path not taken. I could have had a happy life if I married you. Excuse me for talking this way, Marsha. I just want you to know how lucky you are. Hmm. Oh, that's fine. Whatever. No, no, not whatever. Jimbo. She kisses him, looks at Marsha and speaks to Jim. You see, I do that in front of Marsha so she knows how lucky she is. Thank you. I feel lucky. Well, don't you forget it. Are you listening to me? No one else is speaking. <laughs> I love her sense of humor. So anyway, after the prom, Jimbo went away for the whole summer and he didn't write me. I didn't know you wanted me to. And then you and I went to different colleges. And then when you didn't write me, I was heartbroken. Really? I'm terribly sorry. I, I thought we were kind of casual. I mean, we were 17. I was 18. They held me back in third grade. Wanda, if you felt this way, why didn't you tell me at the time? You haven't said anything in 20 years. Well, I've been very busy. And it's hard to be open about emotions, especially painful ones. She chomps on a cracker. So then I went to Ann Arbor and oh, Jim and Marsha, I am so ashamed to tell you this. I was promiscuous. Really? Yes. Gosh, these crackers are making me thirsty. <laughs> when you offered me something to drink, I didn't think it was going to be my one chance. Uh, I'm sorry. Would you like something to drink? Yes. Thank you, Marsha. Anything at all, preferably with vodka. Marsha exits off to the kitchen. She really is a jewel. She really is. Now, where was I? You were saying you had been promiscuous. It was awful. I became a campus joke, but it was because I was drowning my sorrow, you see, in flesh. In flesh. Ah, well, that's too bad. There was this one night, a whole bunch of guys from the football team stood outside my window and they chanted my name. Oh, well, at least you made an impression. Yeah, but it was because I was missing a certain somebody. 
and I also liked sex. Marsha comes in just in time to hear this last remark. Oh, Marsha's here. Hello, Marsha. We missed you. Here's your drink. I hope you like Kool-Aid. Oh, I love it. She gulps her entire drink. Mmm, delicious. So anyway, the campus minister once had to give a whole sermon against me, which made me feel just awful. And all because I was pining for you. I wonder if I should check on the chicken. Please don't go just now. Jim and of course, I, by Marcia. And of course I was raised Catholic, so I knew what I was doing was very, very wrong, but I was so unhappy. <laughs> There, there, Wanda. Yes, there, there. And then, and then my second husband gave me some herpes, and then my second husband gave me herpes, and every time the first one would call to threaten my life, it would trigger an outbreak. <laughs> you know, herpes is often set off by emotional turmoil, you know? Oh, yes, I've read that. End of reading. All right, let's hear it again for Chris and Rianne for sharing their wonderful talents with us today. All of Christopher Durang's work is fantastic to check out if you're looking to be inspired more by surrealist writing. Now, let's dive into our prompt for today so that you can explore the style on your own. Remember, we give new prompts each week. If surrealism isn't your thing, that is A-OK. -okay. We'll be back next week with a new genre to explore. But I want to once again encourage my participants, as always, to take risks and adventure out into all the styles you can experience in this workshop. You're going to learn a lot about yourself as a writer if you do, and likely you'll be that much closer to finessing your own playwright voice and comedic writing style. But this week's prompt is this. It's titled Dream Inspired. We all have had dreams we remember throughout our lives. For the purpose of this surrealist writing prompt, take a moment here to summarize one of your most vivid dreamlike experiences. Now, I don't remember all my dreams, but the ones I do remember, I remember very well. So whatever dream comes to mind for this, the purpose of this experiment, jot it down here. Number two, who are the main characters of this dream? Likely one of them is you. Is there anyone else in there? Write it out. Number three, scene setup. Now, we're just going to jump into this. For your surrealist scene, use the characters and landscape of your dream. Imagine you or the character you create are navigating this world as you actually would in an actual reality while you are trying to make sense of the dream that you are existing in. Have fun. There are absolutely no limits. And if your scene pushes outside of the dream as you remember it, even better. The dream is just the jumping off point for your surrealist exploration. In fact, the dream can be only your inspiration for your script and have no other relevancy for your writing. Whatever works, whatever gets you into writing. And that is it. I cannot wait to read your surrealist work. I personally love when people get weird with it. I really, really hope that you enjoy that exploration. And next week, we're going to be meeting with the Old Globe's prop master, the incredible Dave Buis, where we'll be inspired by props in developing our newest comedic scripts. I can't wait. It's such a treat to have Dave on. And I hope that I'll see you then. Ha 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 ha. Bye bye. Community Voices. Comedy Edition.